know I'm loving it Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it And if you loving it, you can't get enough of it Put a hand high, right where the other is To the weak, but can't find a quitter with me It's that bit of sweet literature, that Lydia Streets Walk with the Prince of Peace, see where these footprints lead Keep my eyes to the sky, looking for signs of a thief Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about hyponatremia, or low sodium content. So how do we classify hyponatremia? Well, hyponatremia is classified when the sodium levels are less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. The sodium content in your body is kind of like a balancing act. The two major players in this balancing act include water, and sodium. Now most of the times you'll be seeing that water plays a largest role in regulating or changing sodium concentration levels. And sodium plays a role actually very rarely. Now the reason why you have to think that the concentrations are milliequivalents per liter. So the concentration constitutes a quantification of the amount of solute such as sodium, potassium, and the numerator as well as a amount of volume in the denominator. So if either one of those changes, then the concentration of that solute, or in our case, what we're talking about here, sodium, changes. So if volume changes, the denominator changes. If the solute changes here, sodium changes. So how does the body regulate the numerator and denominator, or sodium and water, within the body? Well, it does this through a number of mechanisms, which I'll talk about briefly here, but you should read about further in a textbook. So first off, the main regulator of electrolytes in your body will be your kidney. The kidneys function in releasing water, absorbing water, releasing sodium and potassium, and gaining those electrolytes back as well. If there's dysfunction in the kidneys, then you cannot adequately regulate the sodium and water levels within your body. In addition to the kidneys alone, we have hormones that are able to regulate our sodium and water levels. The first hormone I'll talk about is called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone um, is produced by the adrenal glands, and what it does is it tells the body to increase the sodium content and to release potassium. The reason why is if you have a low blood pressure, the body needs to increase that blood pressure by pulling in water. To pull in water, it needs to pull in salt. So aldosterone tells the kidneys, reabsorb salt. And the more salt is reabsorbed, the more water that comes in as well with that salt, increasing the volume in the vasculature and increasing your blood pressure. Now, that's how aldosterone helps increase the amount of salt and water content in your vascular system to increase your blood pressure. But we have another hormone that acts in conjunction with aldosterone, and that hormone is called vasopressin. Vasopressin is released by the posterior pituitary and acts in conjunction with aldosterone. So again, when you have low blood pressures, your body needs to increase its intravascular volume, or volume within the blood vessels. So not only does it produce salt to be reabsorbed, but it tells the kidney to pull in water as well. The way that it does this is that it releases vasopressin, otherwise known as antidiuretic hormone. By the name, you can tell what it does. Anti, meaning it doesn't want it to diurese, diuretic meaning to lose water. So this hormone tells your body, do not lose any more water. So vasopressin actually gains this water by activating V2 receptors. These receptors will become very important, so keep them in mind later on in this lecture. But that's how aldosterone and vasopressin work. Now, atrial natriuretic peptide works opposite of these two hormones. So when you have a lot of volume in your blood and a lot of volume on board, the atria of the heart, or top parts of the heart, get stretched. They release atrial natriuretic peptide, which tells your kidneys, hey, we've got too much volume on board. It's time for you to release all this water. So it tells your kidneys to actually pee out more uh, water to decrease the amount of intravascular volume. Now this is a very brief review of sodium and water regulation. And really, you should look these up and look at the entire system of sodium and water regulation to understand what's going on. But this will give you a little bit of insight into what happens in hyponatremia. So now let's talk about the symptoms of hyponatremia. Well, here are some basic symptoms. First, you have nausea, vomiting, and fatigue, which are pretty generalized symptoms. But the critical symptoms are one, altered mental status, two, seizures, and can even result in death. 
These symptoms in red are very important to identify because they will also change your management plan as well. Now let's talk about the basic workup of hyponatremia. In hyponatremia, the basic labs you need to order are one, a serum chemistry, two, a urine sodium, three, a serum osmolality, and four, a urine osmolality. Now this workup is just the beginning of your entire workup for hyponatremia. Your serum chemistry will tell you your sodium levels, your potassium levels, and your kidney function. Your urine sodium will tell you the content of your urine and whether the body is trying to excrete sodium or retain it. Now the reason why that's important is if, that, is if the body is dehydrated, the body should be retaining sodium. So your urine sodium should actually be low. And testing your sodium will help you delineate whether that's the case or not. Serum osmolality and urine osmolality can also tell you the volume status. Now, a patient's volume status in hyponatremia helps tease out among the numerous causes of hyponatremia, which one is actually causing the hyponatremia. So we separate patients based on their volume status. I'll talk about the relationship between hyponatremia and volume status a little bit later, but realize the importance of these labs are to identify common causes of hyponatremia, as well as to see what the body is doing in terms of its sodium and water content. So now let's talk about some common signs of volume status. So common things you can look for in physical examination includes blood pressure, so low blood pressure versus a high blood pressure. Heart rate is a patient tachycardic, indicating dehydration. Skin turgor is when you pull on their skin, do you notice that it doesn't have a lot of elasticity, indicating they're dehydrated. Dry skin, also indicating dehydration. Whether they have moist mucous membranes, chapped lips, also indicating dehydration. Edema, you notice their legs are very, very swollen, could indicate that they're fluid overloaded. Ascites, mean a lot of belly water. If they have a lot of that present, they're likely fluid overloaded. JVD, or jugular venous distension. So you look at their neck veins, you see they're very distended and large. That could indicate they're very fluid overloaded. Note that JVD can be due to a lot of other causes, specifically cardiac pathology, such as pericardial effusions. But if you're not clinically suspecting those things, this likely indicates a hypervolemic state or high volume status. Wet crackles, so you listen to their lungs, you hear these wet Velcro-like sounds. That could also indicate their fluid overload as well. So these are all things you need to assess in a patient who's hyponatremic to realize kind of what is causing them to be hyponatremic. So now let's take a look at the algorithm for diagnosing hyponatremia. So to diagnose hyponatremia, like I said before, you think about volume status. And we have three classifications of volume status. First one is being hypovolemic, or having a low volume status, being dehydrated. Euvolemic meaning you have just the right amount of water content. And then finally, being hypervolemic, meaning your fluid overload or having too much fluid on board. These volume statuses differentiate between the causes of hyponatremia. In a patient who is hypovolemic, they tend to have decreased water and decreased sodium content. Now remember, that wherever sodium goes, water goes. So if you're hypovolemic or dehydrated, sodium is being lost and water is following. So this can be due to sweating, can be due to medications causing them to pee more, can be due to a lot of things. But it's a shift of sodium and water out of the body. So how do you differentiate between the two classes of causes of hyper, hypovolemic hyponatremia? So you can do this by looking at urine sodium level. If your urine sodium level is high, or greater than 20. That means the body is trying to spill out sodium, though you're dehydrated. So something is causing your body or telling your kidneys to lose sodium and water through the kidneys, though the body itself is dehydrated. On the other hand, if your urine sodium is less than 20, your body is trying to retain sodium. So to realize it's dehydrated, trying to retain sodium, and by retaining sodium, trying to retain water to keep the amount of volume and keep its intravascular volume up and not lose it all. So that's going to be the key defining factor in hypovolemic hyponatremia. 
Now, what are the things that cause a high urine sodium in hypovolemic hyponatremia? These are commonly things like diuretic therapy, so Lasix. Taking a lot of that or an excessive amount will cause you to lose a lot of sodium as well as a lot of water with it causing you to be dehydrated. Osmotic diuresis, so people who have hyperglycemia or high sugars and your kidneys will start spilling sugar out and water follows that as well, causing you to lose a lot of sodium with it as well. So a lot of sodium and water content is lost causing osmotic diuresis and dehydration. That's why the first step of DKA is giving fluids. Mineral corticoid deficiency, so lack of aldosterone, keeping that sodium in. So if there's no aldosterone, sodium spills out, water goes with it as well. And finally, ketonuria, so you have a lot of dehydration and not eating very well, you develop ketones, or in DKA, you develop ketones. And this spills out into the kidneys and it draws water and sodium out with it, making you dehydrated. So you see a constant theme here. Now, for urine sodium less than 20, what causes that in hypovolemic hyponatremia? So vomiting, diarrhea, pancreatitis, because you have a lot of pancreatic edema, so fluid is lost there. Trauma, so things where you lose a lot of sodium and a lot of water through insensible loss, also sweating too, can cause a urine sodium less than 20 because your body is trying to retain that sodium to stay hydrated. And those are the two categories that cause hypovolemic hyponatremia. You can see you need further workups to delineate out which ones it is. Now for euvolemic hyponatremia, you have a general decrease in water or metabolism, though sodium content tends to remain about the same. Now what causes euvolemic hyponatremia? Well, it's a lot of times due to things such as hypothyroidism. Drugs can cause it. Stress, so a lot of cortisol is released in your body that can cause hyponatremia. SIADH, which is the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone release. Some examples of these drugs include SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants. Cancer drugs like vincristine or cyclophosphamide can also cause euvolemic hyponatremia. Now, in euvolemic hyponatremia, the reason is that there are metabolic disturbances causing this hyponatremia. Now, this is different than hypervolemic hyponatremia. In hypervolemic hyponatremia, you develop a lot of water in the intervascular space, as well as an increase in sodium. Now, there are two major categories that cause hypervolemic hyponatremia. And we can separate these out based on the urine sodium levels. And the same theory and concepts that applied in hypovolemic hyponatremia apply here. So for those with a urine sodium greater than 20, they likely have acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, meaning their kidneys aren't able to regulate their sodium content. So they develop hyponatremia. While those with a urine sodium less than 20, they are hypervolemic but looking like they are dehydrated. They're trying to retain sodium. This is likely due to poor perfusion or third spacing. So heart failure is common in, cirrhosis that's common in, as well as nephronic syndrome. Now the treatment of hyponatremia is based on the volume status. For hypovolemic patients, we give fluids, and we'll talk about the specific types of fluids. For euvolemic patients, we treat the underlying disorder. So what's causing the SIDH? Is it a pulmonary cancer? Is it medications? Do they have hypothyroidism? For hypervolemic hyponatremia, we treat the underlying disorder as well, CHF, cirrhosis. We usually use diuretics, but we also use something called V2 receptor antagonists, which I'll talk about later as well. So to treat hypovolemic hyponatremia, there's one golden rule to memorize. One, do not correct the sodium level more than 10 milliequivalents in the first 24 hours. This can lead to central pontine myelolysis, meaning the patient can develop altered mental status that becomes permanent. If the patient does have seizures though, you can treat them with 3% normal saline for a very brief period with very close monitoring. If there are no severe symptoms like seizures, altered mental status, or coma, then you can use normal saline to slowly correct them. If you notice they're getting corrected too rapidly, you need to give them a hypotonic solution. So one would be D5W. 
Also, we can use something called DDAVP. You may have heard of this, and it's commonly used in coagulation disorders. DDAVP is desmopressin, and you can hear right away, it sounds a lot like vasopressin. And it does act very similar to vasopressin. So it retains that water within the body, like vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone and it will actually slow down your correction of the sodium. and really should be used in emergency cases when someone's correcting a little too quickly. Now, let's talk about hypervolemic hypernatremia, specifically diuretic resistant. So commonly for hypervolemic hypernatremia, you can give diuretics and people will urinate and their sodiums will respond and climb back up. Now for patients who are diuretic resistant, we have V2 receptor antagonists essentially a medication that blocks the vasopressin receptor. In blocking the receptor, you prevent water from being reabsorbed by the kidneys. So their sodium in their body isn't diluted out by that reabsorbing of water, and their sodiums will normalize. An example of one type of this V2 receptor antagonist is tolvaptan. We use this in cirrhotics who are diuretic resistant. Now, this was a brief review of hyponatremia. If you like this video, give it a like. Make sure to share this video with your friends on both Facebook and Twitter. If you have any comments or any questions or suggestions for future videos, place them down below. And most importantly, subscribe. This is Dr. K from my medical school, and I'll see you next time.